Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Heritage Foundation's Executive Vice President, Kim Holmes. Good afternoon, everybody. You know you're in trouble when you have to ask people to applaud. Good, af good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure and honor to have all of you here today, uh, particularly with our uh, special guest and uh, some very exciting uh, new uh, announcements being made today and new studies that are being released. We are very honored to welcome Chad Wolf to Heritage for the first time since he was appointed Acting Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security in November 2019. Uh, we are equally uh, honored that Heritage was chosen by the department to feature the launch of its first ever strategy to combat human trafficking, forced labor, and child exploitation. Human trafficking is a global scourge that affects, by some estimates, 24.9 million people worldwide. This number includes the victims of sex trafficking, labor trafficking, bonded labor, and child soldiers among other groups of exploited people. Now, the Heritage Foundation has a long track record of engagement on the issue of human trafficking. We write and we speak fre frequently on the issue, and we've hosted events featuring former ambassadors at large for trafficking in, hum in persons. And we regularly engage with members of civil society who are dedicated to combating what we see as both a human rights and a national security challenge. Human trafficking affects many components of domestic and foreign policy. It affects every region of the world, and it even takes place, of course, in our own backyard. <clears throat> it does not require the crossing of a border to be considered trafficking. It merely requires that one person to exploit another for the purpose of profit. To engage in human trafficking is to violate the fundamental rights of another person. It must be countered and it ultimately must be ended. It is for these reasons that we welcome the launch of DHS's strategy to combat human trafficking. This strategy will, no doubt, complement the commendable work of other branches of government that are devoted to combat, combating trafficking in persons. So with that, I'd like to get on with the business and introduce Acting Secretary Wolf. Chad Wolf was first uh, was confirmed on November 13, 2019, as the first Undersecretary of the Department of Homeland Security's uh, Office of Strategy, Policy, and Plans. The same day, he was des designated as the Acting Secretary of Homeland Security by President Trump. Previously, Mr. Wolf served as the Acting Undersecretary for Policy at DHS, where he led the policymaking process to develop and to coordinate policies that advance Homeland Security's mission and also to protect the American public. <laughs> These have included the DHS Strategic Plan, the initiatives to counter international and domestic terrorism, to prevent terrorist travel, to safeguard the United States electoral process, and of course to protect America's trading interests. Mr. Wolf has been intimately involved in strengthening U.S. border security and addressing the humanitarian crisis on the southwest border over the past two years. Mr. Wolf has over 20 years of policy development and management experience in both the public and the private sectors. After his remarks, he will continue the discussion with Laura Reese, our senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation in Homeland Security. And after that, we look forward to a panel featuring other distinguished guests. We will have Matthew Albens from the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Ken Paxton, the Attorney General of Texas, and Stacey Sheehan from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So we have a lot of ground to cover today uh, on this very important topic, and we will look forward to starting off with the Acting Secretary Wolf's remarks. So please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you, Dr. Holmes, for that introduction, and thank you to the Heritage Foundation for welcoming me here today. Heritage has been a close partner of the department since its inception, 
uh, when many of you here at Heritage helped get DHS up and running. Over the years, we've benefited tremendously from Heritage's partnership, research, and policy recommendations, and still do today. So on behalf of the department and for me personally, thank you for the 17 years of enduring support from Heritage. As you, as I, uh, as you and I know, a lot has changed since 2003. Not only has our department expanded in size, but also in the sheer scope of the threats that we confront on a daily basis. Look at last week, uh, the last couple of weeks in the news alone, and you'll see just how complex the Homeland Security landscape and enterprise is. It's the men and women of DHS who are operating in this environment every day, and I'm incredibly proud and privileged to lead them in our mission to secure the homeland. Even as we're dealing with the so-called hot item threats of the day, we're also proactively addressing a range of other priorities to protect the American people. Today, I'm here to talk to you about one of those priorities specifically, and that is combating human trafficking, the importation of goods produced with forced labor, and child sexual exploitation. The timing of this conversation is important. This year, we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which made human trafficking a federal crime. We've made tremendous progress over the last two decades, but even still, human trafficking and child sexual exploitation are not something that we often talk about. Not necessarily something that we, the department, talks about. I mean, we as a nation don't talk about this enough. Thankfully, this administration has been proactive in addressing these issues. President Trump, Senior Advisor Ivanka Trump, AG Barr, and members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. In fact, earlier this morning, I gathered at DHS headquarters with representatives Congressman Dan Crenshaw, Congresswoman Ag Ann Wagner, uh, who are two leaders uh, that are passionate about this issue and champion it on the Hill. Uh, we had a very productive uh, discussion. We were joined by Texas Attorney General General uh, Ken Paxton and other law enforcement leaders, NGOs, and private sector business leaders committed, committed to ending this scourge. I'm incredibly uh, encouraged by the leadership we've assembled to work on this issue and look forward to working on, uh, on the issue with them in the, in the months to come. But even as we work uh, currently is underway, we, we as Americans, again, are not talking enough about this issue. Let me make myself clear, we need to be. In 2018, the U.S. National Human Trafficking Hotline reported nearly 11,000 cases of human trafficking. That same year, one of our essential partners in the nation's clearinghouse, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, received more than 18.4 million reports of online child sexual exploitation and abuse. That's over 50,000 reports per day. And that number has been growing exponentially every year. These are just the numbers. What they fail to show are the faces, the faces of the thousands who lives, uh, lives who have been affected by these heinous crimes. Take, for example, the sex trafficking victims of the Rendon Reyes Organization, a notorious international sex trafficking organization. These young women were brought to the US from Central America and Mexico were forced into prostitution through beatings, threats, isolation, and intimidation by the Rendis Reyes thugs. These victims were forced to engage in as many as 45 sex acts a night with all of the profits going to the criminal organization back in Mexico. Or take the day laborers from Mexico who were recruited to work at construction firms in California. These victims were kept in filthy quarters, hidden from detection from the outside world, made to work as long as 24 hours at a time with little to no pay. They were threatened uh, with physical violence and deportation if they reported uh, these violations. Or take the young child who was a victim of sexual of torture, sexual abuse, and sexual exploitation by, by Jeffrey Esposito, who just received a 200-year federal prison sentence. This child was subject to bondage and torture sessions with choking, whipping, and other forms of pain. On multiple occasions, the abuser documented the sexual abuse. He then shared that material on the dark web in exchange for more child pornography, which included the sexual abuse of children as young as three. As if these cases aren't despicable enough, our investigators uh, from Homeland Security Investigations who identify victims of abuse online prioritize, have to prioritize the most egregious cases. I'm talking about toddlers and babies who are abused and sexually exploited in incidents as serious as the rape of a newborn baby. No words can capture the depravity of individuals who commit these crimes. Fortunately, we have men and women at Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Homeland Security Investigations, who are working every day to take these evil people down and rescue the victims. It's thanks to their critical work with federal partners, all victims in these cases, 
that I mentioned were rescued and given help. As the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, it's our duty to protect against these horrific crimes. These crimes don't just threaten Americans' personal and public safety, they threaten our physical and virtual borders, our immigration and customs systems, our prosperity, and our national security. The organized nature of this criminal activity, the scale, the cross-border elements, the consequences of abuse, and the terror that these traffickers and abusers inflict on victims make these crimes a national and departmental priority. And nearly every component within the department is involved in this mission. On a daily basis, DHS professionals identify and assist victims of horrendous exploitation, strive for U.S. supply chains to be free from forced labor, and arrest human traffickers and child sex offenders. This is difficult work, uh, but when I talk to our folks doing it, the overwhelming response I get from them, if, if not us, then who? These men and women, ladies and gentlemen, are really the unsung heroes of this space. The challenge we face in all of this is even with one in 10 HSI agents that are currently working these issues that are dedicated to these issues, and even with the resources we have dedicated, it's not enough. Human trafficking and child sexual exploitation cases require the absolutely best software to find victims, the best tools to capture the elusive criminals, the passion and the stomach to work on these cases, and the high level of expertise. Expertise comes with years of experience and training, training which up until now has been relatively limited. Furthermore, sometimes we're the only agents. We're the only ones civilly and, civilly and criminally enforcing a prohibition on the importation of goods with forced labor. We're at a point now that we need to prioritize these issues within the department so that future budgets will provide for the top of, line, top of the line law enforcement and state of the art resources in this fight. And that's why I'm here today. After years of work and close coordination within the administration, I'm pleased to announce the Department's uh, of Homeland Security has developed a first of its kind strategy to leverage all of our authorities and resources in this fight. But let me be clear, the strategy just isn't about leveraging resources, it's about ending human trafficking and child sexual exploitation. The strategy would not have been work without the possible of many at DHS. I want to take just a minute to recognize those folks, specifically Assistant Secretary Elizabeth Newman and her team, Justin Mathis, Liz Harmon, and others as well as my senior law enforcement advisor, Scott Erickson. DHS's strategy to combat human trafficking, the importation of goods produced with forced labor and child sexual exploitation is a formal recognition of the issues as a departmental priority. This strategy is a framework to prioritize our resources, monitor progress so that we can save more lives and bring criminals to justice. Designed to amplify the administration's forthcoming national action plan to combat human trafficking, the strategy is designed around five pillars, prevention, protection, prosecution, partnership, and enabling DHS. With this in mind, the strategy outlines nearly 40 novel actions for the department to date following today's release. I look forward to working with the leadership across the department to ensure that these efforts are swiftly implemented. I'll, light, I'll highlight uh, just a few of them here this morning. First and foremost, we need to understand what we're dealing with. Human trafficking and child sexual exploitation are hidden crimes. That's the point of them. As a result, we really don't have a thoughtful national understanding of what this crime looks like across different areas and demographics. So priority action number one is utilizing our intelligence and analysis capabilities as a department to paint the big picture by undertaking a formal threat assessment. We'll then be in a better place to manage our resources and direct our, our expertise accordingly. Second priority action is in the prevention space because nothing is more important to the mission than preventing these crimes from occurring in the first place. Specifically, DHS is going to expand and revamp our current programming for schools and communities to prevent child sexual exploitation by teaching online safety to children. These programs are critical and, be re and will be resourced accordingly as we build budgets in the future. Third, the strategy establishes a victim's first as a DHS-wide policy. What does that mean exactly? It means that as a department, we're going to continue to balance our law enforcement responsibilities with victim assistance specialists from ICE immediately attending to the needs of victims. The strategy directs us to train law enforcement to be trauma-informed and survivor-informed, understanding that victims of these crimes have experienced horrors that are sometimes unspeakable. In addition, the strategy calls for the expansion of ICE Homeland Security Investigations Victim Assistance Program, which has been DHS's lead in promoting a victims-first approach. Fourth priority action item is developing new critical tools for law enforcement and sharing them with our state and local partners. Our science and technology director will be developing new analytical software and digital forensic tools 
to address these crimes, such as those that they begin to develop for investigations of live stream abuse. In live stream abuse cases, children are forced to appear in front of a web connected camera to be subjected to sexual abuse, which is then live streamed over the internet. As you can imagine, the nature of live streaming of, of abuse makes it difficult for law enforcement, uh, law enforcement to identify a victim. In response, DHS is also going to integrate training on live stream abuse investigations into our advanced cyber training. On human trafficking, we'll, con we'll work with the Department of Justice to launch a new phase of the advanced training and technical assistance program for law enforcement in the field, also known as the ACT Team Initiative. This pri presidential priority initiative has already proven to be highly successful. Fifth, we're going to partner with tech, com tech companies interested in streamlining their coordination with law enforcement in this fight. Currently, when tech companies hand over information on child sexual exploitation for use by investigators, it's often unreadable and unusable. This inhibits our law enforcement from reaching children in danger quickly. Moving forward, we'll continue to partner with the tech companies to find solutions to format that information as best as possible for our law enforcement officers. Priority action six, aggressively enforcing the prohibition of importation of goods produced with forced labor. At U.S. and Customs and Border Protection is the only agency who was able to enforce a ban on importing goods produced with forced label with civil and criminal penalties. They've already been ramping up their issuance of enforcement actions. For example, this past year, withhold release orders included diamonds from Zimbabwe, gold from the Dominican Republic of Congo, and tobacco from Malawi, to name a few. In addition, ICE Homeland Security Investigations is investigating companies and corporate officials who knowingly benefit from forced labor and is looking at charging the first ever cases based on this violation. And lastly, we're going to conduct a new awareness campaign on mental health for DHS employees investigating these crimes and working with these victims. Imagine sitting behind a computer for eight or more hours a day viewing child sexual abuse material, searching for clues to identify victims so that law enforcement uh, can rescue children in serious danger. Imagine being that officer, officer that uncovers a group of workers living in slave-like conditions in a shed Imagine uh, the horrors that these individuals go through. The strategy is going to ensure that we place the health and well-being of our employees first so that they can continue to do their job. As part of the strategy, I will also be designating a, a senior official accountable for keeping human trafficking out of the acquisitions and contracts at the Department of Homeland Security. This has been ongoing for some time uh, as part of uh, contract law, but we are going to identify a senior official to do that. Strategy will also integrate our efforts in such a way that will culminate, culminate in, the center, in a center to combat human trafficking at the Department of Homeland Security, most likely at uh, ICE Homeland Security Investigations. The DHS is only one piece of the puzzle. As I said in the beginning, we as Americans are not talking enough about this. With the Super Bowl coming up in several weeks, and with it being National Human Trafficking Awareness Month, I encourage all of you to use your positions in government, academia, and the private sector to speak about human trafficking and child sexual exploitation. Use your voice to help us end these crimes. To the parents and teachers, know the dangers of the internets. The cr these criminals are out there. DHS professionals see them every day, and they are preying on our children. To government officials, state and local, and members of Congress, prioritize this mission. Make it a priority to eradicate these crimes from your states and your districts. To companies, work with us, especially if you're a tech company. Prioritize children's safety. Stop these crimes from happening on your platforms. And to the real heroes in all of this, to the men and women of the department and our task force partners who are on the front lines of addressing these issues every day, thank you. In investigating traffickers and child sexual abusers, you're seeing the true underbelly of society. This surely takes a toll but you do it never, nevertheless with the hope that more victims will be saved thanks to your work. To all of you who have chosen this noble profession, thank you. Thank you for bringing your light into the darkness of places. Because of you, victims have hope, and because of you, criminals will be brought to justice. Uh, thank you again to Heritage for having me, and uh, look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Laura Reese, and I am the Senior Fellow, Research Fellow here at Heritage for Homeland Security. And I want to thank Acting Secretary Wolf for, for coming to Heritage and discussing these very important issues with us and for uh, sharing part
parts of the strategy with us today, which, uh, as my understanding, will be available online on the DHS right. website this afternoon. So first question is to talk a little bit about the strategy. So as you said, the uh, first legislation for trafficking came out 20 years ago. So why now? Why put the strategy out now? It's actually a strategy we've been working on a little bit of an echo um, for over two years. Uh, so conversation started uh, under Secretary Nielsen about uh, the importance of this. It's a big department. Uh, there's a lot of equities at play. There's an uh, interagency process. So it's, it has taken uh, some time. Uh, it was something that I was very uh, dedicated and, and uh, focused on when I went to the policy office for a short period of time. Um, and so I saw this as an opportunity, uh, again, given where we are with uh, the TVPA, given where we are with January being Human Trafficking Month, uh, we pushed, uh, the entire staff pushed really to sort of formalize the strategy uh, and push it out now. And again, the strategy for us, and I think a lot of people probably in the, in the audience or other, you know, think about a strategy, you, you sort of you do it and then you put it on a shelf and it goes away and you never see it again. So that's not, the, that's not what we've designed here. We've designed a strategy uh, that, again, has buy-in from all of the components uh, around the department. Uh, the design here is to identify priority actions, which we have nearly, I think it's 38 or 40 of them, um, and prioritize those across the department. It's also making sure that the components know that this is now a priority, uh, that as they go about building their budgets, their resources, and their priority actions, that this needs to rise to the top. Um, so we'll have an implementation plan, uh, and then we'll track that implementation plan as we do with a number of initiatives. And what does success look, look like? What are some measures? Well, I think for, that's a good question. I think success for the department looks like uh, implementing uh, the nearly 40 recommendations that are in the strategy. Um, again, these weren't uh, items that were come, thought of overnight. Uh, some of them are um, easy, sort of low-hanging fruit, I would say. Others are a little bit more difficult. Um, and so success will be really implementing uh, that action plan, uh, tracking that, making sure that our components um, are, are fulfilling what, uh, that what they've all agreed are the priorities in this specific space uh, to make sure that we continue to push. So I would say success, as we look at this, you know, six months out, 12 months out, uh, and the like, is making sure that uh, we're continuing to, uh, to improve on this. We continue to build our resources in this area. Uh, and we sort of look across the landscape from not only the law enforcement side, making sure that HSI is uh, investigating these, uh, but also from the victim assistance side, making sure that we're, we're putting that uh, philosophy in the forefront of what we do at the department. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, an issue that's a subset of this, but pretty timely right now, and that is with respect to child sexual exploitation and end-to-end -end encryption on mobile phones. Right. So in December, Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing at which uh, Facebook and, and Apple were taken to task about uh, an unwillingness to put in backdoors, commonly known, um, for, for phones or for Facebook messaging so that law enforcement could <coughs> obtain a warrant and, and see what's on, on those devices. Um, technologists say creating any such backdoor then makes users vulnerable to either hackers or other bad actors. Um, and that it's a, a safety concern for the user of the device. Uh, so it, it, it sets up this privacy versus public safety um, conflict. But you know, what about the safety of the victims when those devices are evidence? They are the means of, of the crime. How does DHS deal with this? It's a good question. We, um, we had a little bit of a roundtable discussion earlier this morning where this, this issue came up. We had law enforcement there. We had private sector, we had NGOs there, and we, and we talked about this. And I think your point is the right one, which is we gotta keep the victims in mind. Um, so I don't think any, anyone's talking about a back door. That's what we're actually talking about a front door. Uh, we wanna make sure that law enforcement has the tools that they need to, uh, to arrest individuals, make sure we get these perpetrators off the street, uh, and they need to have access uh, to electronic devices at times to do that. Um, so I think the AG has been very clear on this. The administration has been very clear on, on meeting that. Um, so I think there is a solution that we can, we can work with the, the tech companies. Um, again, we're not looking for a backdoor in. We're looking to make sure that law enforcement has the information they need to continue their investigations, to prosecute these individuals uh, and the like. But I think first and foremost, we've got to keep in mind the victims out there and making sure that uh, we're taking these folks off the street and we're able to give law enforcement the tools and resources they need to do that. 
Obviously, there's a privacy issue uh, component to this. We need to make sure that uh, individuals' privacy, Americans' privacy are, are you know, first and foremost, but I think there's a balance there, and I'm not sure we have the right balance right now. Uh, we need to continue to work with, again, the tech community and the like, but uh, we need to make sure that when law enforcement uh, obtains a warrant, is able to go in and needs to get information off of an iPhone or off of a, a smartphone of some kind, uh, that they have the ability to do so. Um, switching over to uh, importation of goods produced by forced labor, I think of the three elements of the strategy, that's probably the one that is discussed the least, um, but seems to be rather prevalent. Um, how? How can a U.S. importer ensure that their supply chain um, doesn't include such labor? That's a good question. Uh, again, it's, it's working with CBP. So again, as I, as I mentioned in some of my remarks, CBP is sort of the sole authority when we talk about enforcing these trade and customs laws. So when I think about this, uh, we often see a lot of the human trafficking cases here in the U.S. Uh, and what does that look like, whether they're coming across the border or just here in the U.S. Uh, specifically. When we talk about the importation of goods using forced labor, you're really talking about that overseas. And so how does the U.S. stop that from happening overseas? And we're able to do that through the, through the men and women at CBP uh, and the like. But I would say for those businesses out there that, are, that maybe perhaps don't understand their supply chain, first you need to understand your supply chain, uh, the security involved in there. Uh, but CBP's trade office can certainly help, uh, and there's a lot of resources that they can lean on. Um, so what, what steps will DHS take to help kind of identify these, these sources? Of, of forced labor? Yep. Uh, so again, I think, uh, again, CBP is doing a lot of work there. Uh, they do issue, I believe, reports uh, periodically that, that talk about that. Mm -hmm. They use a number of enforcement mechanisms. So again, some of the withhold orders uh, that I talked about uh, is identifying certain regions of the world and certainly certain companies that um, they've done an investigation on uh, and are using this forced labor. So, again, I would, I would encourage those that want to learn a little bit more about that, again, reach out to, to CBP and, and they'll be able to educate you. And anything regarding procurement or contracting? No, again, it continues to be a big issue at, at DHS. Uh, again, um, this is built into procurement law today. Um, so what we're trying to do in, in the department as well as the USG, uh, you know, writ large, continues to abide by those contracting rules. I think part of the, the announcement today is just making sure it, within the department we're highlighting that uh, by doing that, making sure that there is someone accountable at a senior level uh, to make sure that we are uh, on track with that. Okay. So for um, human trafficking, you, you'll often see posters or ads uh, around in buildings or metro or, or other places, do you see me or right. do you see her? Right. Um, what are some signs that people should look for? Because an, another big campaign is if you see something, say something. So how can the public help? Sure. Well, we certainly have the See Something, Say Something campaign. Uh, our blue campaign uh, is sort of a subset of that, uh, which is a lot of these posters that you see and the like. So what that campaign is designed to do is to work with the private sector, really to push out. So uh, trucking organizations, uh, the airlines, the travel community, tourism, these are places that uh, would likely see some of this human trafficking first and foremost. So uh, our campaign is designed to complement their efforts to make sure that we're pushing information to them. <clears throat> we're pushing hotlines to them. We're, we're giving them the information that they can then train their employees uh, who are oftentimes going to uh, encounter uh, human trafficking first and foremost. So we want to make sure that they have the resources and tools that they need. A lot of what we do in the federal space, particularly in, in this space included, is, is providing resources and the tools to the folks that are on the front line. Um, so even our HSI investigators and others that are working with state and locals, we're not going to be the first time, in many cases, not always, but in many cases, we're not going to be the first people uh, encountering the victims. It's going to be local and state law enforcement, or it's going to be our NGOs, or it's going to be others. So a lot of what we do at the department is making sure that we, have, we provide the resources, we provide the information, um, and we point them in the right direction. So the strategy, you had talked about the, the four Ps, which are, is pretty well known in, in uh, Trafficking uh, Act, pre prevention, protection, prosecution, and, and partnership. Uh, but I think it is worth highlighting that fifth goal, which is um, enabling DHS and making sure people don't forget about you know, the fine men and women right. who, who um, investigate these cases and help bring them to prosecution. 
it takes a lot of training to get uh, develop the skills to identify these cases. And it, as you mentioned, it, it really has to take a toll on these employees. So how can DHS help retain these, these good investigators and, and people who want to make a difference? But you know, after a while, it just burnout can happen. Sure, it's a great question. And again, I, you know, we have some great uh, patriots at, at our Homeland Security Investigations that do this uh, day in, day out. Um, they obviously do it in the physical world, but they also do it virtually as well. <clears throat> so we've been um, working with them on the training. I would also say that the victim assistance specialists also help here. Uh, allows individuals with specific training to come in and to, and to work with these victims. So we're trying to make sure we have law enforcement officers doing the traditional law enforcement and investigative work and the like, and then we bring in other individuals that are more focused on the victim, on the trauma of that victim. So. We've got some additional funding in the FY20 bill uh, that Congress uh, allocated, so we're hiring up. Uh, we need more. Uh, we're gonna be requesting more in future years, and I think that's really um, the future as we go there. Again, I think it's hard on investigators that are doing this 24-7. Um, there are dedicated uh, men and women at, at ICE HSI that do this 24-7, and then there are other agents that just do this as part of their uh, normal work day where they're doing a, a variety of different investigations. So. Um, the training, uh, the enabling DHS and, and putting in strategies to help them cope with some of the work that they see and some of the sort of the, the trauma that they come across is, is critically important. But they'll be the first ones to tell you this is, this is what they get up to do. Um, they have a passion, like most women, men and women at DHS, they have a passion for their mission. Um, and like, as I said, they're, they're truly the unsung heroes. They are. God bless them. It takes a special person. So. I hope, um, yes, we can hire up many and uh, help end some of these crimes. This is, this is very important. Well, I want to thank you for coming today, and congratulations on uh, rolling out the new strategy. And um, we all hope that it is a, a great success. Great. Well, thanks again for uh, Heritage for having me. We miss you at the department. Thank you. Um, but uh, thank you. Please join me in, in thanking you. So right now we are going to do a, a quick transition. I'd ask the three panelists to come join me on stage. We're going to add a couple chairs. Uh, we are going to have a uh, panel of acting director Matt Albans from Immigration and Customs Enforcement, along with Texas Attorney General Ken Paxson and the Vice President at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, Stacey Sheehan. Thank you all for, for joining us here today. You all bring uh, a unique perspective on, on this set of issues. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce one speaker at a time, and then they'll, they will make their remarks, and I will introduce the, the next speaker. And, and when they are finished with their remarks, we'll open it up for questions and answers. So I'm going to start with Matt Albans, who is the Acting Director of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. Uh, Mr. Albans is ICE's Senior Law Enforcement Official at an agency of over 20,000 officers, special agents, attorneys, and mission support professionals who are assigned to over 400 domestic and international offices. Mr. Albans has been ICE's acting, excuse me, deputy director since August of 2018. He previously led ICE's enforcement and removal operations to identify, arrest, and remove aliens who present a danger to national security, are a risk to public safety, and those who enter or remain the U.S. illegally. Mr. Albans has 25 years of federal law enforcement experience, beginning his career as a special agent with former INS in San Antonio. He has also worked in Chicago, Detroit, and at Glencoe, Georgia. Mr. Albans received his B.S. in Justice and his Master's in the Administration of Justice. So, Director, I turn it over to you. You want me to do it from up there or you want me to do it from here? Whatever. Actually, probably for here? Yeah. So, thank you for having me here, Laura. Attorney General Paxton, Executive Director Sheehan, with the Case Analysis Division of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, it's an honor to share the stage with a couple of professionals that are completely dedicated um, to this mission, which is so critical to what we do. Um, 
For those of you who don't know, ICE has responsibility for enforcing more than 400 federal laws and statutes, um, most of which have critical implications to the national security and public safety of this country. Um, but I can think of few more critical and more important than the ones we do in this space with regard to human trafficking and child exploitation, um, both here in the United States and around the world. Um, in particular, our, our global footprint, uh, we have office, 200 domestic offices, but more than 80 international offices, provides us the ability to work very closely um, with these law enforcement agencies around the globe um, to combat these organizations. Uh, as we know, there's a lot of this, this trafficking that occurs just domestically involving United States citizens and, and people that are already here, but a lot of it also involves individuals that are being imported for the sole purpose of engaging in this type of criminal activity. We have known criminal smuggling networks that exist for the sole purpose of the profit that is generated from this human trafficking. Um, and, and they're probably some of the most disgusting people that we come across in the course of our business. Um, as the Secretary mentioned, um, HSI is the primary agency within ICE that is responsible for investigating these cases. Uh, to give you an idea of the scope of, of what they do, um, last year we, made, we opened more than 1,000 investigations into human trafficking, uh, made more than 2,200 criminal arrests for human trafficking offenses, uh, which resulted in more than 1,100 indictments and almost 700 convictions. But even more importantly than that, as a result of these investigations and, and the dedicated work of the men and women of ICE, uh, 428 victims were rescued. They were being actively exploited and victimized during the course of these investigations, and we were able to rescue them as a result. Um, so these numbers mean something, certainly, and we want more prosecutions. Um, we want more criminals being put behind bars. Uh, we want more agents or organizations dismantled, but ultimately, we want more victims rescued and hopefully, ultimately, fewer victims at all. Um, and it's critical, the relationships we have with other law enforcement partners, the NGOs, academia, um, in, this, in this space that are all critically important to what we do. Um, you ask anybody in law enforcement, um, nobody has the resources to do what they need to do on their own. Um, we are no different, and in fact, um, you know, every budget cycle you can listen to the, the media and you'll, see, and, and you'll see all the arguments and, and, and battles on the Hill with regard to the resources that ICE gets. Um, and it's not all related to immigration. Um, this, what we do here in this area, is incredibly important. Um, one of the things that we've done significantly um, is increase our victim assistance specialists and our forensic interviewers. One of the things we want to make sure we do when we identify these victims is not further victimize them, right? We, want to, we need to get the evidence to make these cases, but we don't want to do so in a manner that further victimizes it. So we have highly trained victim assistance specialists, forensic interviewers that are trained in conducting these investigations and doing these interviews in a way that allows us to get what we need to prosecute the cases, um, identify the ringleaders, but at the same time, not create further victimization. And then that's where our work with the NGOs is so critical to getting them the resources they need to try to get back on their feet and restart their lives again. Uh, to put that in context, uh, we had more than 2,600 victims that are victim assistance specialists assisted last year and more than 1,100 forensic interviews that we did nationwide. Um, one of the things that, was that Laura, you asked uh, the secretary was regarding, and, and it's, it's true, is the toll that it takes upon the investigators and analysts that, that work on this. We've made a significant investment just recently. ICE has always had a peer support program, but what we are doing now is increasing the number of resources that are dedicated solely to those officers and agents um, that are involved in these type of investigations so that when we see these danger signs that come as a result of the incredible stress and, and, and terrible things that these people have to see on a day-to-day -day basis, um, that we get them the help and the support that they need as they go through. Uh, we have our HERO program, which takes wounded veterans and trains them to be criminal forensic an analysts. Um, you know, those are a resource that we can also tap into to do some of these cases and, and, and keep these individuals fresh. Some, officers, some agents can go in there and do this for 10 years and be fine. Some agents go in there and do it for two years and they need to get the hell out. And, and it's just that traumatic. Um, I was up in, uh, in one of our field offices earlier this week um, and just looking at the scope of these cases of this one investigation, you look at the diagram of all where money is being transmitted and, and across, and it's, it looks like somebody took an Etch-a-Sketch and just drew lines all the way across, thousands upon thousands of criminal proceeds and transactions uh, related to these, to these investigations. So uh, it's critically important that we keep the people that are working these cases safe and secure as well. Um, it's probably about where I probably, probably do better off in a, in a Q and A. So I appreciate the time, appreciate you having us here, appreciate the partnership we have here, and then look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, next we have Texas Attorney General Ken Paxson. 
Uh, in Texas, he's focused on protecting Texans and upholding Texas law and laws and the Constitution. He has created a human trafficking unit in his office that has helped shut down Backpage.com, which is the largest online sex trafficking marketplace in the U.S. Attorney General Paxton fights federal overreach, bringing several lawsuits against the federal government. He's obtained an injunction or winning ruling in at least 75% of his cases against, brought against the federal government. Prior to becoming Attorney General in January of 2015, Attorney General Paxton served as state senator and member of the Texas House of Representatives. He graduated from Baylor University and earned a law degree from the University of Virginia School of Law. Attorney General, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank Heritage Foundation for, for hosting this and for making this an issue that is important to this organization. It's been very encouraging being in Washington, D.C. the last couple of days. It's kind of <laughs> odd for me to say that it's encouraging to be in Washington, D.C., but it has been. Given what DOJ is doing with human trafficking and the efforts by um, Secretary that he just talked about, I, I think this is something that, that I think Matt suggested is not something that any particular agency or any particular state can solve on their own. And even for me, as involved in politics as I, I've been, I really didn't know much about this issue until I was in the Texas Senate. I saw a bill presented by a Democratic senator for San Antonio and literally horrified by what I heard and the testimony that came in front of me. And I I promised myself, I told her I'd help her with her bill because she didn't have any help at the time from any Republicans. We got her bill passed, and, and I promised myself going forward, anything I could do to, to make a difference on this issue, I wanted to do. And so when I became Attorney General, we didn't have a human trafficking unit. I didn't have any resources for it, and uh, we don't get to print money. So we had to, I had to sort of cobble together three lawyers, a few investigators, and, and somebody to work with the, the victims, and we did that. And... Um, We've really focused on three areas because we can't focus on everything. So we focused first on prosecution. And as Laura said, within the first eight months of, of, of starting that unit, which started in the beginning of my second year in office, it took me the first year to put it together, we were able to go after Backpage.com. And we thought they were the largest online purveyor of, of prostitution and human trafficking, not just in the United States, but in the world. And we, our understanding was that they were in almost 100, 100 countries. And we had the opportunity to work with California, um, which Texas and California don't always work on the same issues, but we, uh, we did that. And we also worked with the Department of Justice. And it was a team effort. We could not do have done this alone, but we were able to arrest the CEO of Backpage.com when he came back from the Netherlands in the Houston airport. And then my team went into his, their offices in, in Dallas and, and shut them down. And we've been able to shut them down completely. And we wanted to send a message really early on in, in our prosecutions that we were not afraid of anybody. We'd go after anybody, and we wanted we knew there would be others. We wanted them to know we were there, and, and hopefully that would prevent some deterrent, uh, allow some deterrence. So we did that, and we've continued to prosecute and uh, have a focus on prosecution, taking down all kinds of different people in big cities, small towns, all across our state. And something you should know is Texas is the second worst state for human trafficking in the country. Houston is the worst city in America. Uh, it's a port city, it's close to the border, and we truly do have a horrific problem in Texas, which is why we're gonna continue to prosecute. And as a result of our efforts, the legislature's taken note and they've actually given us some resources. We've actually, we're hiring more prosecutors and we're gonna continue to pursue prosecuting these people. Second focus for us has been education, because if we can stop it before it happens, that's obviously a better result than, than prosecution. And so we have sent people out from our office all over the state to talk about this issue, to make people aware of the warning signs. We put this on our website. And one of the things that we've done that I think has been very effective, we created a video that's about an hour long called Be the One. And it's not your typical, you know what I'm talking about, government video that's very boring and, and uh, stilted and uh, in black and white. Um, this is a very, I think, well done video. And it, it highlights victims, but it also highlights people that stepped in to save these victims. And they're just normal, everyday people from the guy that was you know, noticing in his affluent North Houston Woodlands home that there was an empty house that constantly had traffic going through it. So he started videotaping and realizing that this was not normal, and he turned that information over to the local law enforcement, and they basically were able to shut down a huge trafficking ring. To the, to the woman who just noticed that there was another young woman that came out of her house every day 
just to empty the trash, and that was it. And so she one day approached her and said, are you okay? And she said, no, I'm not. And she was able to rescue her from human trafficking. Now that woman is in Dallas, and she has her own human trafficking organization trying to prevent what happened to her. So education is, is a big part of what we do. And then finally, partnerships, because as Matt said, none of us can do this alone. We don't have enough resources. As I said, we started off with no resources. And so we try to partner with anybody that wants to, to work with us. We want to work with them, whether it's the federal government, whether it's other states, whether it's nonprofits. Uh, we have worked with the, uh, successfully with a group of truckers. And because they're on the ground, they see things that we'll never see, and they they, rep they will report those and allow us to find uh, the victims of, of human trafficking. So it's in this country, we've, we've had human slavery before, and we decided as a country that that was going to end, and we obviously had a, a, a terrible way of doing that with the Civil War, but we found a way to end human slavery in this country, and now here we are, you know, 150 or more years later, and we have the same problem. And I hope that we together can come to that same conclusion that we're not going to just accept this a little bit in our country or a lot. We're going to stop it together so that this is something that we do not accept in this country. Thank you. Next, we have Stacia Sheehan. She's the vice president of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And she joined the National Center in 1999. She is responsible for uh, oversight of the child sex trafficking team as well as the sex offender trafficking team. And she discusses issues relating to child sex trafficking, non-compliant registered sexual offenders, internet crimes against children, and attempted child abductors. She trains and, and gives presentations to the public, to the private industry, nonprofit organizations, and to law enforcement agencies. In 2011, she created a dedicated child sex trafficking team because there was an increased need for technical assistance and analysis in child sex trafficking cases. This team supports law enforcement agencies to identify and recover children victimized from sex trafficking and successfully prosecutes the perpetrators. In 2017, she was selected as one of 21 representatives on the National Advisory Committee on Sex Trafficking and Children and Youth. This committee advises the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Attorney General regarding improvements to the nation's response to sex trafficking of children and youth in the US. She holds a BA in psychology from LaSalle University with a minor in criminal justice. So now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And thank you to the Heritage Foundation for hosting this event and for the multidisciplinary panelists. Um, it's an honor to be here today from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. We were created in 1984 by John and Rave Walsh and other child advocates as a private nonprofit organization and were designated by Congress to be the national clearinghouse and provide a coordinated response in this country to the issues surrounding missing and exploited children. And through that work, we interact with victims and families, law enforcement, private industry, and the public as we work to prevent child abductions, recover missing children, and detect and deter and combat child sexual exploitation. In reference to this panel today and child, the topic of child sex trafficking, we're the nation's clearinghouse for reports related to child sex trafficking. And through those, we work with law enforcement, first responders, and victim specialists to locate, identify, and recover missing children and children that are not reported missing that are being exploited through sex trafficking. Throughout my remarks today, I'll likely mention children that are exploited through sex trafficking as victims to be in compliance or in alignment with legal definitions, but I absolutely recognize that the kids that are exploited through this crime are victims of a crime but survivors, and that they are not defined by their victimization. At the National Center, we believe that children deserve a safe childhood. And to work towards that effort, we provide a comprehensive response related to child sex trafficking that includes analysis and technical assistance and victim support services to help identify and locate these children, 
help move forward with prosecutions to hold those responsible for their victimization and also to support the families and child welfare as these kids move forward in their recovery. Now, obviously, at the National Center, we're working a lot of missing child cases. And the trends that we are seeing are that runaway behavior are one of the strongest predictors of child sex trafficking risk. And one of the most at-risk populations are those kids that run from the child welfare system. They lack those strategies and abilities to effectively identify and avoid the recruitment strategies of traffickers. Traffickers take advantage with false promises of love, safety, and affection of these children. And these children have needs for clothing, for money, for shelter, for safety. And they get recruited in public locations like shopping malls, schools, sometimes in child welfare group homes and foster care situations, but also online on social networking sites and phone apps. So at the National Center, what we're doing is providing resources to expand and support the efforts of law enforcement. It's not uncommon that a missing child won't remain in the jurisdiction where they've gone missing. And that's especially true when we're talking about child sex trafficking. It's not uncommon for traffickers to move them from city to city or even outside the, the state. So what we do is providing that national scope and that national resources of law enforcement that have been trained throughout the country to align what's best for the child in that recovery and the ability to move forward with holding those people responsible for their victimization. What we're seeing in terms of this problem is last year in 2019, one in six of the runaways that were reported missing to the National Center were being exploited through sex trafficking. We're seeing that traffickers and buyers are targeting teens. The average age of a child reported missing and being exploited through trafficking is only 15. We're seeing this crime uh, impact boys, girls, non-binary and transgender children in historically, the child victims that have been reported to us who were males were less than 1%, but last year that has continued to increase and rose to 6%. In addition to supporting missing child cases, we we'll also operate the cyber tip line. It's a national reporting mechanism that allows members of the public and private industry to report suspected child sexual exploitation. Last year alone, we received over 10,000 reports related to possible child sex trafficking. There is no requirement to make these reports to the National Center, so we think that number of 10,000 is really just scratching the surface. The reason why it's important to make these reports is that each one of those reports gets assigned to an analyst. And as a nonprofit, we're able to leverage the power of public-private partnerships. So that analyst uses donated data technology tools, as well as open source, publicly accessible information. So when the report is provided to law enforcement, it's as most comprehensive as possible. It can include information that demonstrates travel between jurisdictions or states, or links to additional victims and other missing child cases, and that it's assigned out to law enforcement who have received training in the safe recovery of these children. Now, when we're talking about recovery, it's really just the first step for these children. And we need to remember that the victimization doesn't define them, but because of the severe and chronic trauma that they have, uh, under, or have received, that often that recovery is rife with challenges, and that these are crime victims who are deserving of support services. And so additional resources we provide to help mitigate some of those challenges in recovery include planning for that recovery while the child is missing and also after they're recovered. This is especially important for kids who require advocacy within the child welfare system and juvenile justice and are not returning to a safe family environment. For those that are returning to a family environment, that family dynamic has now changed. The child has uh, been the victim of extreme trauma and that can also impact the family as well. So we have a team of uh, social workers and forensic interviewers that are providing resources at the local level uh, for free or on a sliding scale. We also have a program called Team Hope, which is extremely unique in which we partner up a family of an existing missing or exploited child case with a volunteer who has experienced that in the past. 
And it is the one time that someone can say to that family member, I know what you're going through. I will never judge you. And here's what, ha or here's what helped me in this situation. These are really complex cases. So we also provide uh, legis or legal assistance in terms of supporting the family, supporting prosecutors, law enforcement, civil attorneys, because they often involve state, federal, or even international law. So you've heard a lot today about how this is a multifaceted issue, that the kids can be anywhere, and that the traffickers are using you know, complex strategies to recruit them. And it obviously requires a multidisciplinary response. It's one of the reasons I'm really proud to be part of a panel that includes that. But I also think to follow up on A.G. Paxton's recommendations with Be the One, that it's a tasking all of you can take home with today. That it's so good to see this so well attended from so many different professional fields that you can take the information to be the one. That you, if you see something, there are several mechanisms where you can make a report. As you're going to and from work on public transportation, as you take flights and stay in hotels for vacations and for work, as you are engaging in everyday life going to gas stations and convenience stores. This is a crime that is hidden, but it also operates in plain sight. And I'd challenge you to change the narrative in your head. We hear so much from people who have witnessed something that they didn't know if it was enough. They didn't know if it was really a crime, or they weren't sure if they should get involved. Instead of questioning all the reasons why you might be wrong, ask yourself, what if you're right? And how that could impact the child's future going forward. And please know that the National Center has resources to support you in doing that. Thank you. I also want to recognize the NOAA. Yep. I also want to recognize in the audience uh, Deputy Commissioner Robert Perez with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection and thank CBP for their involvement uh, in helping to identify and prosecute these cases. Uh, also a very important role. So before we open it up to questions, um, I wanted to ask the panelists if they wanted to respond or ask questions of the other panelists. No, I, I, I was going to say I do appreciate you bringing up our, our uh, Be the One because I, I failed to mention it is on our website, so it's easily accept, uh, accessible at uh, attorneygeneral.gov. We also will send out copies of it. So it, it, I really encourage you. It's an hour of your life, and it will, I think, inspire you to want to wanna know more and encourage your friends to know more. Yeah, I think the, the only point I would try to highlight is, as, as Stacy mentioned, was um, what we're doing. We've, I mentioned the NGOs and other law enforcement agencies, but with industry, right? The outreach dealing with industry, the hospitality industry, um, the transportation industry, and, and we're putting a big focus on the, in, in HSI on the medical industry right now, going to you know, medical providers, hospitals, nurses, um, going to these medical conferences and presenting and providing information and, and, and danger signs that they should be on the lookout for. Obviously, many of these individuals are being held against their will. There's going to be cases where they end up in a medical situation because of, of what's going on, either from the individual that's trafficking them or someone they were forced to be with as a result of this trafficking. So um, those are areas where I think we have uh, room to make improvements, and we're putting concerted efforts into that. So. Uh, I'll ask the first question and then open it up. Could each of you comment a little bit on this end-to-end -end encryption issue that uh, law enforcement has to face on with uh, mobile devices, and yet that's that's the vehicle for for a lot of these uh, crimes. Start sure. So it's it's critically important. I mean, again, in most cases, the individuals are not going to come forward, raise their hand, say, "Hey, I'm being victimized. I'm being trafficked." Right? It's it's our investigations that lead to these things, and obviously, we have all sorts of tools that we can utilize. I mean, the dark web has made things more difficult. Uh, I got a team of, of, of great agents from our cyber investigation center um, out of, out in Fairfax, which does a lot of this work. Um, to exploit these, these electronic devices and get this data off. Um, I would say there's actually some concerns we have with regard to, and, and Commissioner Perez could probably speak to this as well, um, concerns we have with, with some court rulings recently. A lot of the information that we get is, is via the border search authority that, that Customs and ICE have when regard to these individuals traveling foreign and then coming back in. A lot of times they've got the evidence of this trafficking on their phones and their devices. Um, and there's been some movements in the courts and some movements in Congress to try to limit our ability to exploit that information um, to identify these traffickers and identify these victims. And frankly, that's the biggest concern that I have in that space when it comes to that. So, uh, This is clearly a, a difficult issue. We're a free country. People have their own privacy rights, their own um, 
rights to their own information. But at the same time, whether it's terrorism or whether it's human trafficking, we're going to have to come to terms with whether this uh, end-to-end encryption is going to be something that we're going to accept. And I, I think there's going to have to be a lot of education to the public, because I don't think the public understands what's going on with this issue. It, it's, it's, it's known in law enforcement and, and not much beyond. And so I think we're going to have a, a lot of work to do to educate the public and educate our, our representatives to understand you know, the balance here between personal privacy and how much we're going to be, have the ability to go after criminal activity. I think that as we have seen the crimes involving child sex trafficking and child sexual abuse evolve, one of the biggest impacts in that area has been the use of technology and really the misuse of technology. And as traffickers and those that are abusing and photographing children in child sexual abuse imagery are using technology, the private industry has been working just as hard to develop tools to try and detect it. And with end-to-end -end encryption, that will make it pretty much impossible. And I think one thing that's really important, you heard it in the Secretary's remarks this morning about being trauma-informed and victim-centered, that we need to listen to survivors on this issue as well. And that groups of child sexual abuse imagery survivors have come together and have made statements about how detecting their images and the crimes that happen to them will be much more difficult to almost impossible if this moves forward. And on top of that, the ability to use technology to, to remove their images from distribution, which is a re-victimization of them every single time, again, will be almost impossible. So while I think it's a really complex issue that we need to look at both sides, I want to make sure that we retain uh, the survivor voice as part of this conversation as well. All right, so we'll open it up to questions. Um, if you're going to ask a question, please wait for the microphone coming around. Um, please say your name and your affiliation. Uh, please keep the question brief and do put it in the form of a question, please. All right, starting back there. Is it on? There you go. Okay. Um, my name's Sylvia Standard. I'm with the Church of Scientology National Affairs Office, and this is for the Attorney General. I followed very much the back page issue, but could you update us on what has happened? I know they were arrested, but is the case still ongoing? Kind of what's, yeah, where so are we at on that? We arrested the CEO. He pled guilty um, to various crimes. Uh, the company pled guilty to human trafficking. Uh, they're now using the information from that case to, to pursue others. So, yeah, there's a continuing investigation as the result of that particular case. Hi, I'm Charmaine Yost, and I'm a vice president here at Heritage in the Institute for Family, Community, and Opportunity. So these issues influence some of the work that we do as well. And I want to thank each one of you because each one of you in your own way is inspiring in what you're doing, and, and I thank you for your commitment to that. In terms of the end-to-end -end encryption, maybe your answers sort of answer my question, but I was wondering if from your perspective, do you think it's maybe not an either or between policy um, uh, challenges that make your life more difficult or resources, but do you see, do you feel like you have an open road in front of you to get things done if you had more resources, or do you feel like there's some big boulders in front of you that impede your way in terms of those of us who want to come alongside and and help open things up, which, where, where are you feeling most challenged? Uh, that is such a good question. Uh, so I have a huge challenge in Texas. I don't have original jurisdiction uh, uh, to prosecute, which that means I can't just go prosecute human traffickers. The, the, it's, those, are, those decisions are controlled by local district attorneys in every county. We have 254 counties. And so one of the struggles we have is most of those counties don't have the resources to do it or the expertise. Um, I think in 2016, there were 18 counties of the 254 that actually prosecuted human trafficking. And so this last session, um, we tried to pass legislation that would allow us to have jurisdiction basically over two types of cases. One would be if it was in a particular county, that county DA would have the first right of refusal as to whether to take that case. And if they decided not to, either because of resources 
or just not interested, we could take it. The second type of case we wanted to take was multi-district because so many of those cases are not prosecuted. The bigger you are, the harder it is to prosecute because these individual counties don't really want to cross county lines and step into the, the uh, purview of another DA. And so a lot of these big human trafficking cases don't get prosecuted. And especially as the legislature decided this session to give our state police 50, I think it's about $50 million to investigate. Now there's going to be more cases. And so we asked for that authority. I, we passed it relatively easily through the Senate, but the district attorneys fought it in the House. And I was literally in Memorial Weekend on the last day you could pass a bill. I was calling legislators, asking them to vote for it. We got it to the floor. We got it through committee. Um, and they were able to turn enough uh, votes to stop us from getting that jurisdiction. So what does that mean? That means that, you know, human traffickers are going to go free. Those are, those are cases that otherwise aren't going to be prosecuted. And that, to me, was quite disappointing. So we're not going to stop trying to get that jurisdiction because we are the only really entity in the state that totally focuses on human trafficking. These DAs are, are split among different types of cases. So we have a lot of expertise that we built over the last four years that we would like to use, especially as the legislature is now giving us more resources to hire more prosecutors. But now we're stuck having to wait for referrals as opposed to having the opportunity to go after cases that are otherwise not going to be prosecuted. So that was a great question. Thank you. Thanks, Travis. Mike's coming in here. Hi, this is for Acting Director Albans. Um, I'm Penny Starr with Breitbart News. And as we know, over the last three years, there's been a huge influx of people across the southern border, both legally and illegally. I wondered how this, this issue plays out in that space from your point of view. I know that you're the interior of the country, so from that perspective. Thank Certainly. You. So um, obviously we do have a strong footprint in the interior, but we also are the criminal investigators for any cross-border crime that's encountered by either CBP during their inspectional process or drug traffickers or human trafficking as well. Um, and what we have seen and, and we've talked about in the context of uh, the border crisis is we know that there are, I mean, frankly, it's, it's a new area of trafficking that we didn't see before, and that's the recycling of children. Children that are being utilized and sold and rented in Central America and Mexico, given to unrelated adults for the sole purpose of them ever come, coming into the country illegally and posing as a family unit to try to be released. Um, we've had more than a thousand cases of fraudulent families identified over the past year. Uh, HSI has made significant inroads in that. Uh, we've dedicated more than 400 special agents and analysts to working those family fraud. We've done DNA testing. Um, but these children are being trapped. We know children are being sent back three, four, five times to Central America only to be re-victimized and being brought in. And God knows what they're suffering as they're going through that process or what that individual, once they're here in the country, is going to do with them. They may just let the kid go and put them on the street and God knows what they're going to be subjected to once that happens. So, um, and then obviously a lot of the, 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 our investigations involve um, other disciplines that we, that we, cases we prosecute. So when we start talking about visa fraud, you know, a lot of these, especially when you start looking at Eastern European countries that are doing this, this human trafficking, involves fraudulent visas that are fraudulently obtained or lots of money being paid to individuals to create these shell corporations to bring these people in, acting like they're being posing as workers, when in reality they're going to be brought here as sex workers and, tra and being trafficked in that space. So uh, when we do visa fraud investigations, when we do document benefit fraud investigations, when we do worksite enforcement investigations, when you start looking at these massage parlors or other places that are either doing involved in, 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 human, in you know, sexual trafficking or even labor trafficking, as, as the Secretary mentioned, one of the cases we did in California, where these individuals are being held against their will, being forced to work ungodly hours and, and being kept in inhumane circumstances. So we leverage all the authorities that we have to try to go after this problem, not just from the cyber investigative standpoint. Um, hi, my name is Danielle Yampolsky, and I'm a senior at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so this past semester, former acting director of ICE, Thomas Homan, was invited to speak on campus and was protested to the extent where the event was shut down when he was on campus. Um, and, you know, students at Penn are saying that his presence and his affiliation with ICE makes everyone, you know, unsafe and that they're racist and um, I think mostly referring to um, immigration control. So I guess what do we do when that's what we're up against and not everyone kind of 
I feel like ice has become the scapegoat for a lot of people's um, grievances towards the immigration system as a whole when ice does a lot more than just that. So how do, what do we do about that and how do we fix that? No, that's a great question. And it's, it's, it's highly unfortunate. And unfortunately, a lot of that misinformation is perpetuated by those in Congress and, and the media, um, which don't help the matter and, and put out false information. Um, as, as Benjamin, we, we investigate more than 400 criminal offenses. Um, and so what we're doing and what we've done actively with regard to, you know, we have a, a stronger public affairs outreach program that we're trying to do. Um, in this area, one of the things we start talking about, especially when you're talking about child sexual exploitation and online usage, uh, we have our iGuardian program, which has trained more than 85,000 children, educators, uh, and parents into the dangers of Internet. And, and, and we know kids are being recruited via that, that process. So that's, that's a, a very large part of it. And our outreach to the industry that we're, we're going out to. Um, you know, and frankly, there's a lot. There's so many good stories out there with regard to the cases that we do um, and the, the good that is done with regard to prosecuting these organizations, rescuing these victims, that unfortunately doesn't get picked up in the mainstream media because um, everybody, first off, there's a lot of people that want to focus on the immigration issue, which prevents some of that message from getting out there. But part of it, it doesn't meet the narrative of those, some out there with regard to what we do and how we do it. So um, our officers and our agents are patriotic Americans doing, you know, God's work with regard to the, the critical, especially uh, how can anybody be against um, rescuing children and rescuing uh, people from being trafficked and victimized and international smuggling rings um, and, and shutting those down so that future victimization doesn't occur and getting help to those victims that have already been and prosecuting these organizations. So um, they do an incredible job under incredibly difficult circumstances. Um, you know, as it, one of the things was mentioned previously about resources, this is one of those fields where the corresponding increase in resources is going to lead to a corresponding increase in cases. It just will. Uh, the more resources, excuse me, kid, uh, the, the more cases we have, um, the better, uh, the more resources we have, the better we have. And, and this is one of those areas where, again, you have to keep the individuals working these cases fresh. You could work dope or you could work counterproliferation investigations for a decade. You might get a little bored, but you're not going to be burned out as opposed to working some of these cases and the traumatization that, that you feel as a result of that. Second row. Thank you. Opioids. My name is Christina Pasqualone, and I'm a healthcare advocate for rare diseases. Opioids, what role do you see they play? I know they play a lot. They, they do. They do. And, and Homeland Security Investigations has a robust investigative program into the opioids. Last year, we actually sent records in terms of seized opioids. We seized more than 12,000 pounds of opioids, more than 3,500 pounds of fentanyl. Um, we have seen the scourge that, I mean, not in, only in this context, but the scourge that these opioids have had across the country in some of these communities are devastating. Um, so that is one of our areas where we put, and that's probably the largest case category that we focus our investigations on, are these narcotics trafficking and working closely in conjunction with our partners at CBP, our partners at DEA, and, and we have our Border Enforcement Security Task Forces, which one of their primary goals is to stop the importation of these illegal drugs. We're also seeing it um, increase the vulnerability of at-risk kids, that there are times when either a single parent or both parents are opioid addicted and either um, incarcerated as a result or uh, as a result of their addiction, an absentee parent. And that only increases the vulnerability of those kids. Um, if there isn't a kinship care placement option while they're incarcerated, they may be placed within the child welfare system. And that's a complete change from the environment with which, from which they came. And we're seeing a result of children that are being targeted and recruited by traffickers because of those vulnerabilities. Thank you to Heritage for hosting this. I learned a lot. I'm Mark Newman, I'm advisor to MDF Sourcing. Um, a question for the Acting Assistant Secretary. Uh, to my knowledge, um, ICE has never brought or never been involved in referring a criminal case uh, related to the importation of goods produced with forced labor. I think there was a reference that uh, the Acting Secretary of Homeland Security 
Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a fairly new area where we're, where we're starting to put some resources into getting that. We've done a lot of labor trafficking investigations, obviously, um, but with regard to the ability to, to prosecute these individuals for um, the importation using the forced labor um, is, is a relatively new one where we're starting to develop the groundwork and have these investigations. Unfortunately, um, these investigations take a long time, right? You start dealing with things that are international in scope, especially in countries where we have very difficult ability working with these foreign governments, trying to work with you know, China and some of these other places where these goods may be being made is incredibly complex and difficult, and, it's diffi and, and it creates complexities with regard to doing these investigations. So there's many times um, that we will leverage existing or other authorities to try to do prosecutions um, within our scope that provide us the ability to obtain the evidence needed for that prosecution without having to go through, through some of those routes. But um, it's certainly something we're doing. We're increasing our number of people overseas. I mentioned previously we have more than 80 officers overseas. Uh, we're increasing that number. Again, a lot of that is dependent upon the funding from Congress. If Congress can give us the money to put more people overseas, then there's certainly more we can do and we'd be willing to do so. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ben Fox. I'm a reporter for AP. Uh, this is a question for the Attorney General. Um, I guess, as you may know, the a federal judge has just uh, essentially blocked your state's decision to opt out of the refugee resettlement program. So I was wondering if we could get your reaction to that, your thoughts on that, whether there's any conflict that you I see. Think, I think we want to keep this at human trafficking. That would be my well, I was going to ask I'm, if you I'm can. Happy to, I'm happy to talk to you later, but I'd rather keep this focused on the issue that we're talking about. If that's okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. Hi, I'm Brian Zimmer with Keeping Identity Safe. Hello, Laura. Um, this question is directed to the ICE director and to Mr. Paxton in Texas, the DMV. Department of Public Safety, which runs driver's license there, is a big active cooperator with your program on human trafficking. Uh, not other states. Many other states are not cooperative with ICE or in any regard, let alone human trafficking. So I'd like to ask each of you to make a comment about how important state cooperation is, especially through the Department of Motor Vehicle Record Systems, with your issues, with your pursuit of this objective. I, I think it's tremendously important that there's cooperation between different state agencies. Um, so obviously that's not my agency, but I still think it's important that, that we're working together on a state level and then also um, on a federal level. It's, that's the only way we're going to stop this from happening. So I, I'm, I'm really pleased that that's the, the, I think in Texas we have done a pretty good job of starting to move towards Cooperation and despite you know sometimes big bureaucracies, there seems to be some pretty good communication regarding this issue. Um, it's tremendously disconcerting if you start to have we start to have a situation like we've seen in some states where they're starting to curtail the type of information that we can obtain access to. Information is the lifeblood of our investigations. Um, you're going to put our officers and our agents at risk. You're going to put our our the public at risk because we cannot perform our job um, without having the requisite information. So, for example, imagine our officers trying to set up, or agents trying to set up on a, on a residence or a hotel where they believe there's human trafficking going on in the state of New York, and there's five vehicles that come in there and drop off somebody or go into that, ha that house for an hour and then come back out, and we can't run those tags to see who the hell that just was. That's incredibly dangerous, and it's, and it's a nonsensical approach to law enforcement. Hi, I'm Riley with Senator James Langford's office. Um, I wanted to ask any of you who could provide perspective on what you believe is the best way to address the demand side of human trafficking, particularly sex trafficking. Thanks. I think, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to leverage technology as trafficking has, is obviously still occurring in the real world street tracks and street locations where prostitution and child sex trafficking takes place still exist. But we also are seeing more and more of it online. And that means that the buyers, the traffickers, um, are all going online and using technology as a way to connect. And I think that we can leverage technology 
in a way to identify not only buyers, but potentially high frequency buyers in a way we never had the opportunity to in the past when it really didn't involve the online environment. So I think one thing that's really important is keeping the conversations open between nonprofits, law enforcement, prosecutors, and also private industry to make sure that we're engaging in conversations that develop technology that's effective and that we're all utilizing it. Again, I think that's part, that, that is a huge part of it. Um, you know, I think one of the, the reasons the demand is there is because it's so easy, right? We've got to make it harder for these avenues, to, for these individuals that might not otherwise get involved in this or, or, or provide such a large client base as there is for this, uh, for this commodity um, by limiting the ways that they can get it or not making it so easily accessible. Um, and so I think as we get better at this and more successes, obviously the dark web has made things more difficult and complex with regard to individuals being able to conceal their identities and run these organizations and this trafficking, um, you know, not only in this, in this arena, but other crimes as well from the basements of their houses and, and we have no idea who they are or where they are. Um, it certainly makes it more challenging. So the more, the better we can get and the more technologically advanced we can be with regard to making these crimes harder to commit, um, the better we're going to do with regard to reducing that demand. There's a question there in the back row. Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Sigmund and started Innocence at Risk. I would like to thank the Heritage Foundation for hosting us today. But my comment is, is really to ICE. I want to say that uh, we started, in a sense at risk, started the Flight Attendant Initiative in 2008, working with the national hotline number and flight attendants who came to our office and said, we see what you're talking about and we don't know what to do about it. So we created a manual and working with home working with then with the hotline, with Polaris, started the flight attendant initiative. A year later, I took this to Homeland Security and met with ICE and CBP and later the FBI. And I can tell you that we have worked with them since 2008, hand in hand, and they have saved countless innocent lives. The flight attendant makes the call, asks the pilot to make the call, they call ahead, the plane is met by ICE, CBP, and often the FBI. And that innocent life, whether it's a boy or girl or woman, is taken out of that difficult situation. And it has been the most remarkable, the most successful initiative that I know about. And I'm so grateful to ICE and CBP. And we tell everyone that you are heroes. We're grateful to you and thank you for your support. Hi, I'm Janie Green with Congressman Desjardins' office, and I was wondering if any of your respective organizations have ever worked with app companies like Snapchat or Instagram in order to strengthen their policies to protect children from predators. We have. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, we have. We work closely with industry. Um, we actually have have set up many um, in, in all areas um, where we have investigative interests, where there's help that can be utilized from industry. Um, we meet routinely with any of the large companies that you would think of that are involved in um, you know, cyberspace and, and those things. So yes, we do continually meet with those, um, look for ways where we can partner, because um, again, they're critical to our success um, when it comes to um, information sharing um, and not allow, look, none of these companies want to allow their platforms or their technology be utilized for this crime. So, but a lot of times, again, they're, they're technolo technology people, they're programmers, they're coders, they're not law enforcement officers, they're not criminal investigators. So they look at things through a different lens and that's why it's so important that we have those relationships and we establish that liaison so that we can share our experience and our knowledge to them and, and, and help inform how they use their products and, and the like. So yes, it's critical. I was gonna say the same. <laughs> we, we did notes beforehand, so we're good. <laughs> 
All right, well, given the time, that's going to be our last question, but I'd like to thank everyone for coming, and Heritage is pleased to be able to continue this conversation. It's going on all around town uh, this week, this month, and want to thank our panelists for coming and providing their expertise on the issues, the challenges, and uh, seeking help to prevent and to prosecute these terrible crimes. So thank you very much. Thank you.